everyone. My name is Ken Goldberg, and it's a pleasure to invite you here today, to have you here. And I want to ask or invite you to have a cookie or a piece of fruit or anything like that from the back of the, uh, back of the auditorium. Originally, we were planning this lecture at 11 o'clock. It's a little too early for lunch, and we just said, we, gotta, we, we, I, we have to feed people. We can't have, some, have them come over here and not have something to offer. So um, please take, a, take me up on that. We are delighted, delighted about uh, this, the, the, this event today because we're launching something um, brand new. Um, before I mention that, I'll tell you that we're doing another event next week that has to do, that's called Who Owns the Data? It's an all-day conference here, um, part of Citrus, and it will start at 9 a.m. to 5.30. It's right in this room. We have many speakers, including Brewster Kale will be kicking us off with the keynote on that day. So you can sign up. There's information and flyers outside. And, but today's talk is, is, is an opportunity for us to highlight a new program that we just are getting off the ground. In fact, the official launch of this will be on July 1st. And we're calling it People and Robots. This is a, there's a lot more information on a website and a mailing list you can sign up for with, that will have information and updates as they evolve. The idea is that we're, we're bringing together 60, at least 60 or more faculty from the four Citrus campuses to investigate research at this intersection of people and robots. There's a huge amount of interesting work going on here. It's very exciting uh, and timely, we, we, we think. There's going to be a big effort on <clears throat> deep learning as it applies to robotics. It has been extremely successful in the area of computer vision and in data analytics, but it has not as yet been applied to robotics. So that's one of the big areas we're going to be focusing on. Another one, for example, is in what we're calling precision irrigation. This is timely with respect to the, 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 the current climate conditions we're facing in California. And we have an idea about how to use robots to very, very precisely deliver water in large fields. One of the, the themes that we've been, you've probably been hearing about a lot is the singularity, the idea that, the, that, that there's going to be a point sometime soon when robots will supersede us and uh, will become um, irrelevant. So we, we, are, we are challenging that. We think that this idea is actually really a distraction from the important work that should be, be, that should be done. And there's another term that we're, we're approaching, we're, we're, we're proposing called multiplicity, which is the idea that, in fact, there's a lot more at, the, the, that people, diverse groups of people working with diverse groups of machines has much more potential. And in fact, this is already happening all around us. And it's behind things like the Google search engine, the recommender systems, and many other systems that we're using every day. And that brings us to John, because John uh, is, is, in, is, I really think he's probably the perfect person to kick off this new program. He has been at the forefront, at the front lines of computers and society for, all, for about 40 years. He has a background, actually, in sociology. And he was born in Oakland. He grew up in, the, in Palo Alto. He's um, written about, new, about technology since the 1977. He's worked for a number of um, great uh, publications. You may remember InfoWorld, Byte Magazine. Um, he's been in San Jose Mercury News, The Examiner, and then he joined the New York Times in 1988. When he was, he was there and was one of the first reporters to write about the, the emerging World Wide Web. Since then, he's become He's had a number of, of recognition. He's, been, um, he's on the International Media Council of the World Economic Forum. He's a fellow of the Society of Professional Journalists. He's won the Nathaniel Nash Award and the Pulitzer Prize in 2013. He is, um, he's also one of our own. He's, um, he's been a lecturer here at the, J the J School. He also has an appointment uh, down the bay. Um, but he he's has a number of, uh, of, of best-selling books. He's written a, a series of books um, that, that always address the questions of high technology in the context of, of culture. And so he's written about cyberpunks, about, um, about, about the, uh, and, and particularly one 
that came out a few years ago in 2005, what the Dormouse said, how 60s counterculture shaped the personal computer industry. It was a fascinating account of the intersection of, of, of 1960s counterculture, which we love very deeply here at Berkeley, and how it influenced computing. He now has a new book, and this will come out in August, that is entitled Machines of Love and Grace, a quote from a Richard Brodigan poem. And he is, um, and, it, and, and the, the title speaks for itself. And uh, when I heard about this, we were having a conversation, and I, I, I cajoled him to, to come, because I think this is absolutely right at the intersection of the issues that we're, we're, we're interested and excited about. So thank you for coming, and please welcome John Markoff. Thanks, Ken. Um, <clears throat> hopefully, we won't be irrelevant. Hopefully, we'll be pets at best. Um, Mar uh, Marvin Minsky's uh, point of view. You know, this is sort of a, a marketing disaster. You can't buy this book for a couple of months, but I can point you to either Amazon's uh, website where you can pre-order, or perhaps my own uh, local bookstore, um, books, uh, Bookshop West Portal. Um, so uh, this is about what I've been in involved in. I'm going to talk about this book project, which began a couple of years ago and uh, discuss some of the characters that I, that I write about in this book. Um, first, just a tiny bit about my background. I gave up on covering computer security about four years ago. I'd been writing about it since the mid-1970s, and I decided if I had to write about one more testosterone-poisoned uh, teenage boy, I was going to have an aneurysm, and it was time to do something different. And uh, getting away to AI and robotics has been a, a really a, 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 a lot of fun. But essentially, in, in my uh, time as a reporter, I've, I've, I've written basically two stories. Um, the first story was the rise of personal computing in the internet. And more recently, I've written about robotics and AI. And I, I, I prefer not to call them revolutions. That's a widely used term in Silicon Valley. I, I think of them as tra transformative. I like to use, to reserve the word revolution for uh, events that requ you know, involve political violence. Um, and, uh, but uh, the Valley tends to use the revolution, the revolution term widely. Um, and I think that if you follow the recent debate over the computerization of work, um, which has come and gone in the United States since the 1950s, you can see that we're, uh, <coughs> in the last couple of years, remarkably spun up um, on what the consequences of this new wave of AI is, is going to be. And I tried to look at it from the point of view of the people who are designing the machines that will uh, bring, bring this about. Um, and you know, there's what's wonderful from a reporter's point of view about where we are now is that it's, it's really like uh, the blind men and the elephants. You have the same set of facts, and you have a wide spectrum of opinion about what's happening uh, now. And you know, I tried to answer the question of um, whether there's really something different about this new wave of AI technologies that are uh, infiltrating society, that have, uh, that have touched off this debate on automation. And uh, you know, I frame it in terms of a dichotomy. And the dichotomy is between um, augmentation and automation. And um, um, just sort of to cut to the chase, um, my view, and, and this is particularly because um, uh, I, my quarrel is with technological determinism, um, my view is that uh, what we do still matters and will matter, um, um, particularly what the designers of these machines do. Um, and uh, is any particular technology inevitable? Uh, my answer would be no. Um, that we shape, as you know, McLuhan and Churchill before him have said, um, we shape our tools and then uh, they shape us. And I think that's sort of a profound insight and still very true. And um, can these technologies have a, a positive or humanistic uh, impact? I think the answer is still yes. And you know, my, my caveat is um, this is a reporter's eye view on what's going on. And, and my, my, um, my beat has been Silicon Valley since the mid-1970s. And you know, first, just a little bit of what led to this book. This was my last book, and it was based on reporting I did in 2001 and 2002. And I was trying to, I mean, basically, it was something of an exercise in uh, anti-autobiography, if you will. I was gone uh, in the Northwest going to school from 65 to 75. I'd grown up in Palo Alto. And I came back, and this industry had emerged by 1975. And I was trying to understand and explain what had happened uh, in my absence. And um, what struck me at the time, because I was looking at a very small geographic area from which the, the, the net and the personal computer emerged. And what struck me is that 
in the early 1960s, right around Stanford University, two laboratories emerged. Um, one was uh, on uh, one side of campus um, was um, John McCarthy's lab, and on the other side of campus was Doug Engelbart's lab. And um, they really sort of uh, defined two philosophies of um, uh, sort of our approach to computing writ large. Um, on one side, Doug, uh, who you know is the inventor of the mouse um, in Menlo Park, and the, you know, in a broader sense, sort of the work done at his group, which was the Augmentation Research Center, broadly led to personal computing and the internet through a sort of a very direct path um, leading from uh, his group to Xerox to Apple and Microsoft um, and the web. Um, but most of all, Engelbart, who um, you know, passed through the halls of Berkeley as a PhD student, um, but dis discovered this article written by Vannevar Bush in the 1940s while he was in the Navy in the Philippines uh, this idea of a memex, a machine that could augment um, human intelligence. And that really stuck with him. He had this epiphany um, while he was looking for work. Um, and um, he decided he was going to make his life's work to build this stuff out of the electronic technology that, that emerged. And um, w you know, what's wonderful, uh, a couple of un little no lesser known stories about Doug. One is that you know, um, it's legendary that HP sort of missed the computer uh, revolution the, first, uh, the second time with um, uh, when Steve Wozniak offered them the Apple II and they turned them down because they didn't want to get into computing. Well, they had an earlier chance with Doug where uh, he had an interaction with a, a HP executive and when he found out that they had no plans to get into computing in the 1950s, he decided that he didn't want to work there. Um, one of many errors that HP made over, over the years. But, you know, the other thing you might not know as well about Doug is that he gave the first uh, paper uh, shortly after the invention of the integrated circuit sort of uh, exploring its implications. He really understood scaling in 1960. He gave a paper at an IRME meeting. Um, and at that point, he had an a good understanding that the, the follow-on dynamics he wanted to build, there would be enough computing power for it. And he went on to do it. Um, several years ago, I had the opportunity to ask Gordon Moore about this, because of course, we know Moore's law was originally codified in 1965 in the electronics article that he wrote. and. Um, and uh, then uh, named by Carver Mead. And uh, Gordon, who's a really plain spoken direct man, said, oh yeah, I heard that. I was in the audience. And so D Doug's article on scaling really was there right at the seminal moment. But he saw it through this prism of augmentation. On the other side of campus was John McCarthy, um, who was a mathematician. Um, the first time he was at Stanford in the 1950s, he was still in the Communist Party. Um, <coughs> as a matter of fact, one of the funny stories, he was still in the Communist Party uh, as, as late as the uh, as the 1960s when he was in Princeton. And um, there were three people in the Princeton uh, party cell. Um, and there was uh, John, and there was a black cleaning woman, and of course there was an FBI agent, because there was always an FBI agent <laughs> in, every, in every cell. But of course he would be driven out of, uh, uh, he would leave the party over, um, over Czechoslovakia, and then he would move to the right. But that's a slightly different, um, different uh, path than, than I'm going on here. Um, he believed in the early 1960s that you could build a working AI in a decade. And um, he was funded first by Ivan Sutherland in the early 1960s. And in Mind Children, uh, that's, that's where I got that, that point from. Uh, Hans Moravig uh, notes in Mind Children, in, 19, uh, in 1962, they thought it was a decade-long project um, to build a working AI. And of course, you, you could, there's a long history of of over-optimistic pre pre uh, predictions on when we're going to get these working AIs. The best one I found was in a New York Times article in 1958 announcing uh, Rosenblatt's uh, de uh, design of the first perceptron, the sort of the roots of neural, neural networks. And at that point, they felt a working machine, a working thinking machine would be built in a year. So now we've gone to 20 years. That's sort of the standard model of 1945. In 20 years, anything can happen, so it's very sort of Con convenient. But basically, I, was, I, I noted in, in, my, in my last book that there were these two groups on either side. One, one wanted to de design people out of systems, and one wanted to augment systems. And I, I would argue that that led to these two communities that have defined the modern computing world. One is the AI community, and the other is what's known as the HCI community, people who want to augment. And in fact, those, those communities largely don't talk. And the book is about those communities, the people who uh, define them and whether or not there can be any kind of a synergy because I think that's probably the right, the right answer. Um, 
And you know, the, the, there, there is a bit of irony because Doug at that point in the early 60s was an outsider. You know, John McCarthy was working on the white hot center of, of computing, artificial intelligence. Doug was working on what was seen as word processing. And the irony is, at least initially, it was Doug's work that led to the great commercial growth of the computer industry. And only now are we coming back and seeing the same kind of growth in the AI. So dial forward um, a couple of decades. AI goes through some, some, um, some great trials. There are two AI winners, the first one in England in the 60s, the second one in, um, in the United States in the 1980s. And uh, we get to 2004 when Tony Tether is director of DARPA is sort of hunting around because Congress has mandated that we have a third of all uh, uh, military vehicles autonomous by, guess when, 2015. How are we doing? We haven't really made it. And, he's look, and the DOD contractors haven't been doing it. And he's looking for a new way. And he starts these DARPA contests. And I was talking to Andy at that point, who I think was just coming or had, uh, about to come to Google. And he said, that, uh, he said this. And you know, he, he, this is a great quote, but I didn't quite get it. Uh, I didn't quite get the implications of what that meant, that robots were leaving their cages and starting to move around in the world. And, uh, but over time, it, it dawned on me. And um, while I was looking at you know, now if you look carefully, you see robots every, everywhere. I, I have what's called the Type 2 autonomous vehicle, um, a car that has adaptive cruise control, and it, uh, it uh, automatically brakes. And uh, it, uh, it has lane keeping, and it, it oh, by the way, it, it, it recognizes bicyclists and pedestrians. And so we are kind of like the frog in the pot. This, this stuff is happening to, all around us. And I was working last year at Stanford in, uh, in a place behind um, the campus up by the golf course, and I would go to Coupa Cafe for breakfast. And one morning I drove up and I parked my car and this Tesla pulls up next to me. And the woman opens her trunk and she takes out her, her golf cart and she walks off and the golf cart follows her. And I just, you know, the first time you see this, you know, I'm a terrible, it's like the Yeti. I mean, it took me like 30 <laughs> seconds to get my, my smart camera out of my neck. But you know, and uh, you know, then you go and Google this thing and you realize, um, Caddy that, Trek, the robotic caddy that yeah, follows. Anybody with 1795. The caddy Trek is modernized. This is just high end golf caddy to Valley. assist the golf with cutting edge technology and convenience. With its innovative uh, hands free design, enjoy walking the course without the hassle of dealing with your clothes. Now, the, 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 the five actually, the coolest track thing about can move this with you at your own pace is that it has a push mode modes, because when you're on the 17th hole and you're going out of electricity, and and the pushing is like a big Caddy Trek is easily flexible to carry around um, and put into your car. So, you know, where did this come from? You, you really have to go back into our history to understand where we are, where we are now. And this is Charlie Rosen, and the robot is Shaky. Shaky was the first autonomous um, uh, robot. And uh, you know, it, its DNA is like diffused throughout the entire computing industry. Um, uh, Charlie was a, an important uh, physicist early on at SRI. He was one of the rainmakers. He actually funded Doug Engelbart. Um, he was the co-founder uh, of Ridge Vineyards with three other families from SRI on the side. And he also went through this early experiment um, uh, there before LSD was illegal. A number of engineers and other creative people were taken through an intense LSD experience on the peninsula. And he was one of the four or 500 people who went through that experience before. Um, but he um, was able to sell the idea of an autonomous robot to the Pentagon um, in, the, in the 1960s. And um, <coughs> um, one of the things they asked him, the idea was that you could build a robotic sentry. That's, you know, our drones today, this is where the original roots were. And the idea was that um, you could build a robotic sentry. And they said, you know, could it carry a gun? And Charlie said, yeah, at least two or three. How many do you need? <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the people who design these machines and the impact it has on them and the, the, the impact they have on the machines. And one of the first people I, I focused on it was a young man by the name of Bill Duvall. He grew up on the peninsula. He came to Berkeley in the early 60s. He took all the computing classes you could take at Berkeley. At that point, there was no degree. He dropped out, uh, and he moved down to SRI, where his dad was a physicist. Initially, he went to England to work on an um, automation program for the banking industry. That fell apart for a variety of reasons. And he showed up in about uh, 1969 and briefly worked on Shaky. Um, as a low-level technical programmer. And, and Shaky at that point was being run kind of in a hierarchical, top-down uh, fashion. It was a military project. Um, he, was, he chafed very quickly. And down the hall from, from Bill was this kind of crazy project run by this guy by the name of Doug Engelbart. 
and it looked like a lot more fun than working on Shaky. So he sort of bridged, he was one of the first people to bridge that gap between IA, IA, intelligence amplification, as Doug referred to it, and AI, artificial intelligence. He joined um, in, in, during 1969, and Bill's, Bill's an important and largely unsung person. He is, uh, was on one side of the Watson come here quick moment for the internet. That was the first message sent on the, the evening, at 10 o'clock in the evening, October 29th, 1949. He was no, at node one, Charlie Klein was at node zero. I don't know if you know this, but the purpose of the ARPANET originally was to permit remote login to the NLS system, online system that Doug Engelbart was building. It was the first killer application of, of, the, of the modern internet. And, um, and uh, Bill was there. The other thing you might not know is uh, at LOG, because it was remote login, the machine crashed at a G. Uh, it was a buffer overflow problem, which uh, to me is another reason to give up on computer security. We had a buffer overflow problem at the dawn of the modern network, and we still haven't solved this particular problem from a security point of view. Um, but um, Bill went, uh, went on to work, not only he, he, he designed the journal for the NLS system, um, he was at Xerox Park where he worked on the Alto, and then he went off and was on the Mac team, and he did the assembler and the compiler for the first Macintosh. So he was sort of crossed over and was the first one to sort of go to um, the the uh, IA side in my mind. Um, the other thing I learned in this process, this is uh, William Shockley, and you know one of the things I tried to explain in my first book is where did Silicon Valley come from? And you know I, my argument has always been it's been about serendipity. Well, it was because Shockley's mom lived in Palo Alto. Why did he come back from Bell Labs to? to because his mom was there, she was in failing health, he wanted to move there. Um, also, the first Justice Department lawsuit in, in the 1950s, uh, AT&T, AT the ruling led to the mandatory free licensing of the transistor that Silicon Valley wouldn't have happened without, without that. And finally, a congressional legislation that allowed institutions to create uh, the venture capital industry. And I thought that you know, that's sort of a, a serendipitous model of Silicon Valley, but I learned something new recently because of David Brock, who was researching uh, Gordon Moore's um, uh, uh, biography, he stumbled across these papers in the Stanford Archive um, about Shockley. And it turns out that there was an automation craze in the late 1940s and 1950s, um, right at the at sort of the dawn of interactive computing. And what he stumbled across, this is a schematic for a, a computer vision robotic eye. And what he stumbled across was this memo that Shockley wrote inside Bell Labs to build an automatic trainable robot. And Shockley was passionate about this, and it's just, it's wonderful. A trainable robot will comprise hands, sensory organs, a memory, a, and a brain, which coordinates the information furnished by the sensory organs with the, with the memory in order to perform desired options. In principle, the trainable robot problem is unlimited in its scope. So he was very passionate about this, and AT&T decided not to go there. And that is what led him to Charlie Beckman, who funded, not the eye, he funded the transistor, but the uh, initial sort of motivating you know, reality was that, that Shockley wanted to build a robot. And that's at the very heart of Silicon Valley, which I think is not really known. Uh, when Rod Brooks saw this memo, Rod Brooks is a roboticist who created uh, Rethink Robotics and has Baxter, which is essentially this thing. He passed the memo around to his uh, employees and nobody could date it. And it's really remarkable that, uh, that Shockley had that, that goal right at the outset of the interactive computing era. So um, here we are many years later, and uh, we've got people like uh, Elon Musk and Bill Gates and Hawking all warning us about the imminent appearance of, uh, of emergence of the singularity. Well, the singularity hinges on scaling. Unless we get this, you know, we continue this rapid march that we've been on um, for the last X years, we're not going to get there. And I would argue that it's over. The party's over, and we just don't know it. And, you know, a, a couple of points to make that argument. When I was first writing about supercomputing, uh, the consensus was that exascale computing, the you know, ability to do a billion, billion operations a second, was going to show up in 2018. But we're obviously not going to make uh, exascale computing by 2018, maybe by 2023 if we're lucky. Um, I was just at this Stanford symposium, it's called System X, where the designers were talking about new systems and new architectures, and we're, we've reached the 14 nanometer uh, feature size um, on time, but the joke on the, on the, on the insiders is they defy you to find a 14 nanometer feature on the silicon that they're making. Um, we're just hanging on by our, uh, the edge of our, uh, our skin, and the reality is that there's this phenomenon called dark silicon. You can put all these devices, uh, 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 all these transistors on these devices, but you can't turn them all on at the same time anymore because the chips will melt. 
And so you can have a lot of transistors, but you're not able to, to run these things at the kind of speed in the way you'd like to. Denard scaling, which was this corollary to Moore's law, everybody acknowledges it ended in 2006, and clock speed is frozen. So um, that's, the, you know, that's the sort of the context that this sort of discussion, or the backdrop of this discussion about the singularity is happening in. Um, I wanted to show you the, the characters who I, I, I sort of built this book around. One is uh, um, uh, Terry Winograd. Um, Winograd was one of the most significant early AI researchers. He began doing his work in the 60s at MIT before moving to Stanford and Xerox. Um, he wrote a program called Shridlu, which uh, basically was Siri for a blocks world, natural language understanding. It had a tremendous influence on, um, on the, uh, the AI community early on. He came out here and he continued to work on it for another decade, decade and a half. And he began to have these discussions with folks at Berkeley, namely Searle and Dreyfus, two philosophers who were very skeptical about the ability of thinking machines um, to be designed. And ultimately, in the 1980s, early 1980s, Terry walked away from AI, and he moved over to IA. He crossed over and focused on doing human-centric design for the rest of his career. Um, <coughs> uh, you know, one of the things that um, I think, well, a couple of things that came out of that that I think are significant. At the end of his career, he, he launched a program called Liberation Technologies at Stanford, working on human-centered computing. And um, he had a really uh, dramatic impact on the world, which I think is largely gone uncharted. You know, he was Larry Page's thesis advisor, and he wrote this paper with um, Bryn and, and Page, and uh, Bryn's advisor called The Web in Your Pocket. It was Terry who convinced Larry Page to work on searching the web rather than building robotic cars. Um, so there was this direct sort of uh, point of, of impact. And of course, I would argue that um, uh, PageRank uh, was probably one of the most dramatic IA uh, sort of inventions, mining humans and giving us back to augment our, 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 uh, our, our brains. Um, and now, of course, whether Google is an IA or an AI company is a really interesting question, which, which brings us to uh, Andy Rubin. Um, and Ru Rubin was a robotic, uh, hobby, uh, robotic hobbyist who sort of crossed over from the other direction. He went from IA, from working for Apple, and then he was at General Magic, Web TV. He created um, a really early powerful uh, handheld phone called Danger, Sidekick. And, and then he built the Android ecosystem for Google. And then uh, sort of vanished uh, after that and went off and built this robotics uh, industry for, um, um, for Google that is still to emerge. Um, Google hasn't said anything about what they're doing in, in, uh, in robotics. Uh, Andy left after a year. But wh what I can tell you is that uh, when he was going around recruiting um, the companies that he put together, a dozen companies, including Boston Dynamics, and companies like Shaft and other, other companies, the vision he was sketching out was a 10 to 15 year journey. And in particular, he described the notion of the Google uh, uh, car showing up in front of your house and the Google robot hopping off the back and dropping the package on your steps. And then, you know, if you, it seems kind of like a wild idea, but if you think about the Amazon drone, it's not as wild as the drone flying up. So um, they're somewhere on that. And actually, if you think about it, um, and think about what Amazon has done to build this infrastructure to develop packages. And if, if Google wanted to compete with them, the idea of leveraging the brick and mortar companies with a logistics infrastructure that was automated makes, makes a certain amount of sense. It's in fact the fact he's doing. I, you know, originally I wanted to build the book around Ruben and another guy whose name is Tom Gruber. Um, and Gruber is an example of an AI researcher who crossed over to IA, going the other direction. Gruber um, began as an AI researcher in Massachusetts. He came out to work with Ed Feigenbaum, and then he became very influenced by some of Doug Engelbart's ideas. And during the 19, um, during the dot-com era, he attempted to build a company to commercialize some of Engelbart's ideas. It almost got critical mass, and then a lot of, a lot of uh, it, like a lot of the things, it, it cratered. Um, ultimately, he would end up uh, joining Adam Chire at SRI to become one of the two architects of Siri, and. Um, um, both of those guys, Chire and, um, and Gruber, were very closely identified with Engelbart's ideas and saw Siri as an augmentation tool, um, framing it that way. And um, at the end of uh, his life, Steve Jobs seized on this idea, took this bet that he could reinvent computer interfaces, and uh, he, bought, he bought Siri. Um, just, um, you know, so both 
Rubin and Chire and Gruber were influenced by science fiction ideas, I would argue, in meaningful ways. Um, you, if you know, I can't get a good picture of it, but Knowledge Navigator, um, is, is uh, which I'll talk about in a second, is this Apple Vision video that appeared in 1987 that had a tremendous impact on Silicon Valley. And of course, Blade Runner, uh, this is a scene from Blade Runner, also, also has a, uh, had a tremendous influence. And I would argue a real inf influence on the people who design these systems. Um, in particular, Ruben, who got the uh, domain name android.com and uh, is lovably referred to as his friends as the android, has this, uh, has this fascination with ro robots. And if you've ever been to his house, and, and if you've ever seen the character J.R. Sebastian in Blade Runner, who was the bioengineer who built these things, um, Andy sort of fits in that model very well. On the other side of the coin, Knowledge Navigator was, um, you know, Steve Jobs leaves uh, Apple in 1985. John Scully has a problem because uh, Jobs is competing with him. He's got this tech co company called Next. He turns to Alan Kay, who'd come from Xerox to, to um, Kay had come from Xerox to, to uh, Atari to Apple, and he said, I come up with something like the modern, modern dyna, like a, a modern dining book for me, which Kay thought was kind of humorous because the dining book hadn't been invented in his mind yet, but he did. And he, a lot of his ideas went to the Apple video group that produced this, uh, this vision video that involved a smart avatar um, that w was a conversational AI that looked a little bit like Steve Jobs and an absent-minded professor. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, that video had a tremendous influence on both Chire and Gruber. And, and, and they really set out to build Knowledge Navigator in Siri. And so it's an example of sort of these ideas so I went, um, I, I, I went to Kay and I said, so, you know, where did the ideas about conversational interfaces come for you? Because I'd, I'd associated Alan with WIMP, with the windows and icons. And he said, well, you know, I was just channeling ne Nicholas Negroponte. And Nicholas, of course, was the, um, the, the founder of the Architecture Machine Group at MIT, um, sort of, in some ways, a, a disciple of Ivan Sutherland's, um, uh, that early work. And later, um, um, he, he set up the Media Lab, and if you go and look at the, the early, uh, the early videos and demonstrations of the, at, the, at, the, um, at the Media Lab, it's, it's all there. Um, and so I went and asked Negroponte, so where did these ideas come from? And he said, well, I got them from a guy by the name of Gordon Pask. And I said, who? Who's Gordon Pask? I'd never heard of Gordon Pask. Gordon Pask was a British cyberneticist who was a frequent visitor uh, around MIT in the 1980s. And so, you know, in, in, in this interesting and strange way, it goes back to Wiener and cybernetics. Pask was here, um, and Pask basically was significant in that he basically situated intelligence in the conversation between two people. And that was the idea that, and thread that led directly all the way to, to Siri. Um, Pask, of course, leads us back to Wiener, and so Wiener, uh, uh, you know, coined the term cybernetics in the late 1940s. He saw it as the scientific study of control and communication in the animal and machine. Um, the, the funny thing about it, uh, Wiener is that two years afterwards, he would sort of then try to alert people to the consequences of, of, of what he saw in the, uh, in the automation um, forces that were being unchained by robotics and AI. And he wrote this book called The Human Use of Human Beings. Before he wrote that, um, uh, the New York Times uh, approached him in 1949 to write an essay about uh, what he saw the implications and the impact of cybernetics might be. And he wrote it, and the Times asked him for a second draft, and he wrote it again. And uh, the Times then asked him for a third draft because they thought they'd lost some of the first draft. And he was in Mexico by this time, and this really irritated him. He said, this project is over. I'm done with you guys. And it would have vanished, but a friend of mine who was going through the archives at MIT found this correspondence, and we were able to publish um, this, uh, this essay where he lays, uh, and it was, if you read in the modern light, it's tremendously foresighted. We, we published it 60 years late in the science section of the Times, which I was very pleased with. But, um, you know, um, Wiener had an impact, um, and in particular, he had an impact on Walter Ruther, um, although you know, they were moving into the Eisenhower era, and so it was long delayed. But, you know, R Ruther met with him in the early 1950s. They decided to agree on this Labor Science Education Association. And um, um, this is uh, Ruther at a Ford Motor uh, plant in Cleveland in the mid-1950s. And, of course, there was that wonderful interaction between Ruther and the Ford executive. Um, 
the, the Ford Motor Executive is asking uh, him, uh, showing him this new automatically controlled machine in the mid 50s, and he asks him, How are you going to collect union dues from these guys? And Ruth replies, How are you going to get them to buy Fords? And we're, of course, we're still at that, uh, that, uh, that point years later. Um, so cyber, cybernetics kind of vanishes off the screen in America. It has more influence in Europe. But I, I stumbled across this in the archives, um, at, at John McCarthy's archives, actually. Um, cybernetics had an impact, and artificial intelligence, intelligence in McCarthy's uh, words, who coined the term AI, was coined in part in trying to escape association with cybernetics, which I think is kind of, uh, uh, kind of profound. But uh, McCarthy was very straightforward about it in the mid-1950s when he invented this field. Uh, he was trying to distance himself, not just from the term, but from Wiener himself, who, who McCarthy else, other, elsewhere has referred to as a bombastic bore. He also said elsewhere that he was trying to define a field in opposition to the work, that, uh, in sort of distinction from the work he was doing with, uh, with uh, von Neumann, uh, focused on um, cellular autonomy. So he wanted to create this new field, but it's interesting to me that uh, AI emerged in opposition to, to, um, to cybernetics. So, um, you know, dial forward a couple of uh, decades, AI goes to these two, win two AI winners, and we come to, um, we come to this. 2004, Tony Tether is, is struggling um, to find ways forward. Um, AI is in kind of bad repute, and we have the first of the advanced challenges. This is Red Whitaker's, um, this is, this is Red Whitaker's vehicle, um, Red Team, at the first um, autonomous vehicle event in 2004. Um, Whitaker should get great credit for this because he had proposed the idea as early as 1991 of an autonomous vehicle race across the country. And um, it finally happens with Tether. Um, and the first uh, grand challenge is kind of a, a benchmark and a disappointment. Um, you know, uh, the red team made it seven miles uh, before they ran off the road, but they were really having trouble finding the road even there. There's crossing the, crossing the intersection, the other side of the intersection. It was really quite amazing that they made it seven miles uh, at all. Um, uh, it was fun. It was a fun event, but it actually put a stake in the ground about how far we had to go. This is Andrew Lewandowski, a Berkeley student who had that motorcycle. He forgot to set the switch when he, uh, he left the starting gate and it immediately fell over. Um, but at the end, I was able to fly over uh, the, the field and it was strewn with dead robots. And it really seemed like we weren't going anywhere, anywhere quick. Um, so dial forward 18 months um, and um, I'm able to get my first uh, robot ride. Uh, that, that's me, and to my right is uh, Sebastian Thrun. The, the robot was the Stanford robot Stanley. Um, in the back seat was Mike Montemerlo, another uh, roboticist who'd come with Sebastian Thrun from CMU, where they'd worked with Red Whitaker to sort of compete with him at, at Stanford with support from Volkswagen. And it was clear that in the space of a year and a half, they'd made tremendous progress. Um, we set off in the Arizona desert. It was a little bit like a slightly bumpy ride on a Sunday uh, uh, afternoon, and it was, it was, you know, it was feeling to me like, why do we need crash helmets? This is, this is, you know, this is sort of done. And then, you know, what can go wrong? Um, we, we came over this swale, and there was a branch hanging over the road, and the lidar saw it. And before Sebastian could hit the e-stop button, we were off the road. Can't really see it here, but this was right between two piles of boulders, so it was kind of fortuitous. Um, Sebastian was really qu quite creative, and he sort of straightened out the lidars, and and we, we took off again. Um, and uh, Montemarillo took out this block of code that was supposed to make the robot more comfortable for humans, and we were on our way. Um, it was a tough day. There were all kinds of things that sort of set us back. But um, you know, um, with a couple months after that, um, this had a, a dramatic Ladies and gentlemen. On. Boys and girls, it's been done. It's actually more thrilling than it looks, but uh, Red Whitaker's team led for most of the way. They had a mechanical failure, and um, Stanley, Stanley won. And uh, Tony Tether was, was vindicated. Um, it, it led um, in, a, in a pretty direct way directly to, to Google X. Um, it, it sort of launched Sebastian's career. He became director of the, S uh, the Stanford AI Lab. He went on to, um, to Google X and the secret projects. It was kind of a, a really poignant. Uh, this is Red Whitaker after the event. Um, uh, you know, he gave this a, a really remarkable speech on any Sunday like a football coach. And, um, and uh, a year later, 
he came back and had his re revenge at the, uh, the Urban Driving Challenge, um, where he, with GM backing, he, he won, and the Stanford uh, team was, was, uh, was second. So three years later, um, the automobile industry is dramatically affected by this. And I'm, I'm, I'm giving you this history because I, I think the same thing is happening now with the, the, the next grand challenge. But um, in particular, the automobile companies realized that there was a parallel here and that they were at risk of finding their, themselves in the same position that the hardware vendors were with respect to Microsoft when Microsoft developed the operating system that ran all the world's computers. They didn't want Google to develop the operating system that ran all the world's cars. And so within the space of um, you know, a, a half a decade, virtually every car manufacturer in the world moved a, a laboratory to Silicon Valley. Um, and you know, I, I, I began uh, hearing rumors. Sebastian had gone to AI, the AI lab. He kind of talked a little bit. And there were these rumors running around the valley that Google was driving cars on public highways at night um, on 280 down to Los Angeles. Um, and it, it's, um, the, the, the story was that the rumors were running around for a long time. And finally, I was actually at a family Christmas party. And my, um, my uh, cousin's son said to me, you know, I, I went to high school with this guy who's being paid $15 an hour to sit in a car driven uh, by Google to sit in a car that he's not driving. And so I went to Sebastian. Um, after I'd walked over to campus, and they were literally hiding in plain sight, um, anybody who wanted to. I think the reason they were able to get away with this for so long is they were also driving the Street View cars, and the Street View cars had this large mast on top of them, and nobody could tell the difference between the two, and they were driving at night, too. So I was able to get my second uh, drive in a, uh, in a, robot, a robot car, and uh, at that point, the, the progress really had been dramatic. Um, the most amazing thing about my initial drive was the car merged onto 101 in afternoon traffic, and then it went over that flyover into Mountain View. And uh, the, the, the sense I had when it went over the flyover, I was not in a robot. It was driving the way a human would drive. And since then, they've gone on. Um, that, that's a, a, a long story that I won't, I won't get into, and we're, we're at a very interesting point. And Google sort of shifted its direction. Um, but I wanted to talk about a, a couple of other uh, th uh, things here. And this is sort of our progress on Andy Rubin's vision. Um, this is Boston Dynamics um, before the, um, uh, the, the grand challenge. This is as, as designed by the best roboticists in the world. Uh, this creates a certain perception. You have to remember this is teleoperated. Uh, what we're, we're seeing here uh, is humans and machines working in tandem, even though it looks like it's just machines. Um, <coughs> here's the reality. Um, this is a team working with a machine designed by Boston Robo Robotics before the last right, year. Uh, some students at Worcester Polytechnic. Um, and you can see it's a lot more like watching grass grow. Is that a So I'm, I'm very interested in seeing the June event, which will be the finals, and seeing how much progress the robots have made. And I'm pretty sure that it will be closer yeah, to this not handle it? than to this. <laughs> controlling them. Um, and that's actually true for this as well. Um, I don't know if you've seen this on the internet, but this shows the rate of progress in a really dramatic way. Um, this is Spot. Um, what's interesting about Spot in part is they've made Spot both for DARPA and for Google. Um, for one would assume different applications, one would hope different applications. Um, but look at how, how, how quiet, you know, they've, they've... Now, but the interesting thing about Spot um, there are a number of interesting things. Um, so it's wonderful. You know, this is Mark Rebert's, Mark Rebert's work, and he's one of the best uh, designers of ro walking robots in the world. And he sort of has a mind of his own. And he didn't ask Google if he could release this video. And um, Google just totally freaked out internally um, because um, what it touched off was when the robot was kicked. It turns out there's a robot lovers movement in the. In the and they were just freaked out that people were kicking the robots, which I think is a very significant fact, actually. That's a, so um, 
so there you go to the point of climbing up the stairs and delivering your, your package. They can get up the stairs if, if, they, uh, if they need to. So, um, so while that was going on, in, in 2010 and 2011, I began following another thread because it was clear that it was, it was just not just happening in the world of mechanical things and blue collar, it was happening in the white collar t world too. And um, you know, the common wisdom was that um, Keynes was right, that uh, technologies dislocate um, uh, workers, but not, but not the overall amount of work. And then it, that consensus started to be challenged widely in, in 2011. Uh, it became clear that, that uh, these technologies can have impact on lawyers, um, um, uh, doctors, and journalists. Matter of fact, uh, just, uh, I guess it was uh, just last year, HP began um, doing its earnings stories uh, um, with narrative science. And that's where I began my career is with earnings stories. So they're like, you know, they're right behind us uh, and, and it's, it brings it home. So um, after I wrote that, I began looking at the issue of manufacturing uh, ag again as well. And I, had, I tried to get to China, and because there's this little quarrel between the New York Times and the Chinese government, I wasn't able to get to China. And so I looked around the world, and I found this factory, which is in the Netherlands, and it's, it was just built at that point in 2012 by Philips. It makes razors, not smartphones. They had been planning on moving the high end of their razor manufacturing to China. They discovered with 128 adept uh, arms in, that operate in serial, every two seconds they, they do an operation, they're able to build a, a plant that makes 15 million razors a year. And what was significant to this about me is this is from a mechanical point of view more complex than building a smartphone, which is largely electronics. Um, this is about mechanical assembly. The difference is you build a razor and you don't change it for a decade. You build a smartphone, you have to be able to reprogram the factory in nine months to, to 12 months. And so the question is how quickly will um, these, uh, these machines be um, uh, more flexibly programmed. Um, so you can see it coming. I also went to a factory in, um, I also went to a factory in Milpitas just down the road um, run by Flextronics which makes solar panels and uh, what was great about this is they had this big sign because Governor Brown was there bringing jobs and manufacturing back to California. It's a, a solar panel factory and I counted the workers. There were nine workers on the line <laughs> and you know multiply by three you have 27. So the jobs are coming back. They may not be that many. Um, so, but a caveat. Um, so, you know, we're all sort of certain that this is happening, and I've actually become skeptical about a lot of uh, the stuff that's been written. Um, this was a book written by, in 1995 by Jeremy Rit Rifkin. He argued for the end of work in 1995, and the rich irony is that the U.S. economy grew from 115 million workers to, to 137 million workers in the decade after his book. But this time for sure is the, is the common wisdom. Um, I remain skeptical for a, a number of reasons. This is sort of a, uh, you know, a, a, a sketch of what's happened. Um, it's great from a reporter's point of view. Um, as this began to happen, I think David Otter had sort of the most profound and worrisome point in 2010. He talked about the hollowing out of the middle class as these routine, routinized jobs in uh, the, the middle class are disappeared. But you can get an argument from something like the International Federation of Robotics that argues that, that uh, robots will create millions of new jobs because of indirect economic activity. And, and uh, of course, there's Robert Gordon, who's this sort of grumpy old economist who argues that productivity is this one-time bump that happened with the advent of computerization, but it's over. And if, in fact, Moore's law is not going at the pace, maybe he's right. Moshe Vardy argues no jobs at all by 2045. The most troubling uh, uh, sort of point uh, to my mind is this NBER uh, paper uh, last, uh, last December, which argues that, in fact, it's not hollowing out like Otter said, that was, you know, he argued there was growth at the high end and the low end, no middle class. What the NBR guys found out is that um, it's actually a downward slide. And so that high skilled workers are displacing lower skilled workers as they're pushed down the, the, the job structure and the people at the bottom are pushed off. That said, when you start to look at the specifics, um, it gets, it, it's just, it's very interesting. This is, all of the books that have come out recently on this subject have sort of pointed to Kodak versus Instagram. 140,000 workers at Kodak, 13 in Instagram, um, you know, they killed Kodak. That's, the, that's the, easy, the easy description, and it's just absolutely wrong. First of all, if you're going to make this argument, you have to ask what happened to Fuji. Fuji, which was a competitor to Kodak, did fine just crossing the chasm. Ca ca so you have to make that explanation. Um, the other question, uh, thing that comes up is it rapidly becomes obvious that 
that Kodak was a company that put a pistol to its head and pulled the trigger a number of times and it had nothing to do with the internet, um, which Quentin Hardy here has, has written about at some length actually in the Times. Um, but you know, um, Instagram could not exist until the mature internet emerged and the mature internet according to McKinsey uh, generated 2.6 million, mostly good new jobs and was responsible for 21% GDP growth over that time in the uh, developing world. And I just wonder if the agricultural workers who are being pushed off the land at the start of the Industrial Revolution would have seen uh, the future clearly at that point. Um, ATM is another good example because uh, President Obama got in trouble um, uh, several years ago when he said there were fewer ATM workers. It turns out there aren't fewer ATM workers, that the number has remained rather stable. What's happened actually is that the internet and computing has led to the explosion of bank a ba a branch banking, many new branches, they want consumer facing employees and so that's actually increased the number of, of uh, bank tellers and what's, go what's gone is the, the back office of the bank has vanished. The people who used to handle checks and they've, they've evaporated. Um, so the, the question for me is what job should stay and what job should go? Um, one of the companies that Andy bought was called Industrial Perception. They're now inside Google. Um, and they're driven by the So this is made possible when you get um So, um, you know, they were going to get a contract with, um, with um, UPS. With, uh, humans move a, a box about every six seconds. Uh, they weigh up to 75 pounds. They get tired. Their backs get hurt. Um, they thought they could get to um, a box every four seconds. Uh, and so I, I think it's kind of that part of the logistic supply chain is, is, is basically over. There weren't them, that many workers who were actually physically moving boxes. But think about stocking shelves in supermarkets and other kinds of opportunities. That's clearly um, uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the horizon. Uh, you know, but it, once again, it's nuanced. Uh, there's a company that's gotten a lot of attention in, in San Francisco called Momentum Machines, um, started by a, a young man by the name of Alex Bratikoskis. And it's created a tremendous, it, it, makes, it makes hamburger uh, making machines, tremendous amount of attention. And, um, it, people are worried he's going to he's going to do away with the guys in the back uh, back room in McDonald's. And but Vardikoskis, that's not what he wants to do. He wants to go after Blue Bottle and build a model of making hamburgers, which is similar to a Blue Bottle um, uh, coffee chain. Basically, you'll pay nine dollars for a hamburger in his view of the world because it will be a custom, perfectly made hamburger. And the interesting part about his model is that there will be a human concierge uh, serving you a robot-made hamburger in his his worldview. He wants to hire unskilled workers. They, his idea is they will work in his chain of, of hamburger places for two years, and the trade-off will be that he will offer them a range of sort of audacity offered skill uh, training programs so that it's up and out. You come through and you're gone after two years with the skill to do something one step up the ladder, which I think is an interesting idea. Um, I'm, I'm going on too long, but just a couple of, uh, couple of uh, last things. Um, just wanted to say about Watson, um, it was kind of a, a scam. Um, it turns out that at that level, everybody's really good at answering questions. Watson's advantage um, was actually in mechanical. So it answered questions when it had a statistical advantage. And there is this window when you can press in. And Watson was really good at pressing in better than the, human, the humans. That said, deep QA um, is going to uh, bring us to this world of machines that answer questions over the telephone. I think it's coming very quickly. And that'll have a big impact on the workforce. Um, Bloomberg wrote, wrote, ran this story last, last year. I thought it was very significant. Um, they automated the Toyota manufacturing line as much as possible. At a certain point, they put humans back onto the line because perfectly automated lines don't do one thing. And that is, they don't improve the quality of the line. So the humans were put back in. And I think that's, a, that's an interesting model. Um, I also, um, the elder care is a, is a question is a long discussion. But you know, every advanced society in the world is aging. And um, it, it may be true that robots come just in time, um, that, that 
the a robotic model is the one that will succeed in caring for elders in an advanced industrial society. Um, this is Gary Bratsky. Um, he was one of the authors of an uh, open source library called OpenCV. He's one of those people who made that transition from AI to IA. He was an Intel researcher. He worked on the Stanley Project. He started OpenCV. And recently, he went from Industrial Perception, the company that was a startup, to a company called Magic Leap, which is doing augmented reality glasses, which in his mind is the, um, basically the reinvention of personal computing. It's a human-centered technology that um, will, will basically, I mean, Magic Leap, the company that, that he's working with, believes that they can destroy the Asian display manufacturing industry, that in the future, we will not have displays and we won't sit at laptops, but if you want a display, you'll do this and there'll be a high resolution display in front of you. And you know, I thought that was great science fiction until recently when I actually got a chance to see uh, their technology. And I now think it's, it's actually a reasonable expectation. Um, the, the, the technology is very intriguing, and it could, it could be human-centered. Um, uh, just one other uh, point about conversational AIs. Think the movie Her. Um, this is a woman by the name of Liesl Capper down on the right. She had a company in Australia that was making FAQ bots. Um, the interesting thing about her FAQ bots half a decade ago, she put them up on an Australian bank that was um, using an FAQ bot just as a natural language text, text interaction um, uh, uh, vehicle. And 90% of the people coming to that um, FAQ bot thought there was a human on the other side of the interaction. So I, my argument is that the bar on the Turing test, or what was described as the Turing test, is much lower than we actually think. Uh, the interesting story about uh, her company at a certain point, she decided that she wanted to get a little more publicity than the FAQ bot thing, and she began uh, de deployed two different uh, services. One was called My Perfect Boyfriend. The other one was called My Perfect Girlfriend. Um, needless to say, My Perfect Girlfriend got a lot of traffic. Um, she put a paywall up for My Perfect Girlfriend, and 4% of the male, presumably male visitors, continued to pay for the privilege of interacting with My Perfect Girlfriend. She read the transcripts. She discovered she'd become a digital madam, and she turned it off in, in horror. But I think um, that there was, there, were, there was a sort of a profound uh, insight. Uh, you know, in, in the book, I sort of, uh, where I would like to draw the line is at, at a cyborg. We need to keep a bright line between the technologies that we're developing and the humans. And it's increasingly possible that that line can be crossed. And cyborg, of course, was a term that was created by NASA scientists in the 60s to build these creatures to travel in space. And um, now, um, all of a sudden, uh, it's possible that uh, we will all be ruled by algorithms. And um, that's, that's a longer discussion that I won't get into. Just uh, so briefly, two more thoughts. Um, back to my Moore's Law point, uh, never mistake a clear view for a short distance. Um, I think that still holds true. And to go back to uh, Wiener's uh, original insight in the 1949 essay he wrote, we can be humble and live a good life with the aid of machines, or we can be arrogant and die. Thanks very much. Sure, if people want to hang around, I'll be glad to. John, great talk. Um, you mentioned only one woman and no people of color in this whole thing. Um, is there any, what's with that? Well, what's with that? I think that in keeping with the nature of the computing industry that uh, I'm reflecting what's out there, as, uh, as, as sad as it is. Um, um, and I, I, don't, I don't have a, a good answer to what will bring um, I, well, I do have a good answer, actually. I, mean, it's, I think it's, it's something I read about that's happening here in Berkeley. Um, it turns out that the participation rates in, in, uh, in the programs that I'm, now I wish I could, I, it's, it's something that's happening in, at the engineering school. When you change the study matter um, to human-centric things, it turns out the women's per, uh, participation in, in these mathematics and engineering-oriented subject goes way up. Which was, a, which was a real interesting insight for me. And I, I think there's been some confirmation of that at other places besides Berkeley. So maybe there's, there's a hope in this sort of IA-centered uh, focus. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Uh, on the um, uh, on the issue of our uh, tools changing us after we change the tools, the uh, is it arrogance to recognize that child development studies over the last 10, 15 years are showing that uh, babies that are raised uh, without human interaction with caregivers or with face that their own neurology uh, doesn't develop the way babies who are raised. So the idea that we're going to have all of these caregivers to make it easier to raise children because they're not going to get impatient with a troublesome kid or they're not going to get impatient with a slowing senior that or all the other conveniences that that amplified or enhanced machine interaction is going to give us that they won't result in better people they're going to result in worse people so I, I think that's a, a, a profound question I, two thoughts one is um, you know I, I was aware of that my my mother worked in the Palo Alto East Palo Alto School District for um, for several decades and and she was extremely frustrated because by the time the kids would reach her uh, at age five or six, it was too late for the school district to have an impact. And I'm very intrigued by the work that Javier Movilon is doing at Berkeley, in which, um, so if in fact you're culturally deprived as a child, can um, uh, an interactive system make a difference? And his work suggests that it can. It can make up for having a non-middle class upbringing. And so, um, I, I, you know, I, I'm not ready to write off um, interactive systems entirely yet. Um, based on the stuff that he's done with preschoolers in San Diego. Uh, maybe it's a question of design. Uh, so. Hi. Hi, I'm Brandon. I'm an undergrad CS student here. So I've read a lot about this and I was just interested to hear your thoughts on whether or not, like, I, I see that the world is becoming software defined and as computing technology is integrated into lots of different things, cars, robots, coffee makers, everything, um, it can be controlled increasingly just through software where everything is an API and you can you never have to actually really build physical, th you build physical things once and then you define them through software. So do you see that, it, uh, all the advances you said that keep jobs around seem to be the implementation of these in things that haven't been touched yet, that were the, the frontier of technology integrating into things is still increasing. Once you hit saturation where everything is an API, does this continue or then is it just a small force of sustaining are you Robot talking about with, with respect to jobs and what happens to jobs when well, everything... Well, yeah, well, what, what happens to jobs when you no longer n are pushing that frontier as fast? Because it will hit a limit eventually, right? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I just, I, I cited those two examples where um, I think I think it's a question of design. I mean, we have some choices, what I would argue. You can, do, you can now, increasingly, the people who do these designs can design things in or can design things out. And so... Uh, you know, I, I really resist saying that anything is inevitable. Um, we as a society, I think, have the ability to decide whether we want to, to engage people. And, and uh, you know, I just, uh, science fiction has such an overwhelming influence on people. I, I, I mean, I'm, you know, and I'm steeped in it too. Um, and I, I, you know, it's obvious we're going to reach the Internet of Things point. And I think that essentially we have an unlimited ability to amuse ourselves. And if we do reach a point where we no longer have to do physical or even intellectual labor, um, that in fact we will find things, ways to pay each other for our, uh, you know, for our time. It's not clear to me that, that it's inevitable that there are no jobs by 2045. Yeah. Well, I saw both. Uh, I saw Chappie and Ex Machina and Transcendence and Her. I try to, to keep up on these things. I, I actually uh, compare, you know, it's, it's so, you know, Chappie got terrible ratings. Uh, and I enjoyed Chappie for what it was worth. And Ex Machina got uh, wonderful ratings. And, and Quentin and I saw it and we couldn't believe it. I mean, from, to my mind, Ex Machina was entirely derivative. And it was essentially, um, you know, uh, Turing t Test meets ho uh, horror movie. You know, nothing, nothing new there. But a Chappie, at least, was fun. Uh, I don't know if it was if it was believable. You, you know, willing suspension of disbelief was really necessary to watch Chappie, but I enjoyed it as a movie. Uh, although I think his first, what was it, Plan what, District 9 was the best one by far, and Elysium was pretty terrible. So, anyway. 
a yes. question. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, as we look at the development of artificial intelligence, and you were contrasting that with, uh, you know, IA um, and Doug's work and Augment, uh, how much work is being done these days in trying to understand what consciousness really is? Um, well, the, in the neuroscience world, a lot. Um, I, I don't know about in the computing world. Um, you know, I dipped into that a bit, and. Um, I think the consensus is, um, unless you're talking to people like Kurzweil or Hawking, that we have a long way to go. And uh, the stuff that I've read that suggests that we're farther down the line than, um, uh, than we might want to be on understanding consciousness. I had an interesting conversation with Gil Pratt, who runs this uh, project at DARPA. And he made an interesting distinction between the progress that um, the, the, uh, the AI world has made on perception, which has been dramatic, and what he describes as cognition. And it's not clear to him that cognition is amenable to big data yet. That's to be proven. And that, I thought that was an interesting way of looking at the world from a computing point of view. Uh, let's set aside neuroscience. Yeah. I have a question about your informants. Um, one of your earlier uh, protagonists was a member of the Communist Party. And at one point, folks who were in the Communist Party had to think of themselves as historical actors with historical consciousness and really think of themselves as acting onto something they called history. What about um, your contemporary informants? Um, do they think in these categories? Do they think of themselves as historical actors? That's, uh, so, uh, I mean, I, framing that as IA versus IA, what I found in doing reporting is that um, a, a lot of the IA guys didn't want to step up to the ethical issues. They just they were engineers and they were they were interested in specific problems and they had a very narrow view. People in the IA community by and large have a broader view, I think, and they see their work as being, you know, humic centric and having kind of Doug Engelbart augmentation point of view. I, my sample size is way too too slow, uh, too, way, way too small. Um, there was once upon a time an interesting group in Berkeley called Community Memory. And I, just to your point about the Communist Party, I remember that um, they found a, a young man working outside of their project in the streets in Berkeley. And he was a member of some Marxist group. And um, they uh, pulled him into Community Memory that did early, early, interesting early software work because they decided it was easier uh, to train a communist to be a programmer than to train a programmer to be a communist. <laughs> that was Tom Athanasiou. I hope he's not here. But anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's interesting to me that you draw this distinction between uh, actually augmenting like uh, people's bodies, I guess, when it seems to me that that's almost a natural extension of all the work in uh, augmentation that has come before it, like prosthetics and replacement hearts and knees and all that stuff. What's, why, why, why do you draw the line for people doing that yeah, without so, that? I, you know, I have to admit, I haven't thought about this deeply, but I have worried about this, once again, science fiction inspired notion of the Borg. Um, what can possibly go wrong? If Google and Facebook are designing algorithms that make our decisions for us, I mean, one of the things I, I describe in the book is, um, you know, Google now is, to me, a sort of symptomatic, and Siri perhaps, symptomatic of sort of a generational shift. My generation uh, basically was very negative about, it, about us telling us anything. And now we seem to have moved to a world where we take our life instructions from, from our cell phones, w willingly. I mean, you know, we have a generation that's very, uh, very sympathe sy sympathetic to that. And um, you know, I, I, where does that go? And where does it go if, you know, in, in Neuromancer, the, they de de defined that thing as a Microsoft with a small m. You could jack in any kind of functionality you want. That was science fiction. Read the brain project now. Read uh, the, the intent of the Obama brain project. And they not only want to read from, but they want to write to the human brain. That's not science fiction. They want to be able to read a million neurons simultaneously and as, act, actually write to neurons. So what could go wrong? What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to comment on the very first question, I think that gender imbalance really remains to be addressed here. Uh, but uh, within, you've mentioned the, the broad dichotomy between AI and IA. W within AI, over, over the years, over the decades, there's, uh, there's sort of been the rise of the Bayesians versus, versus the diminution of, of the model-based ap approach, and which sort of points itself up, particularly when, when language comes in. 
and when, when, when understanding comes in. Uh, do you have any comments on, on that dichotomy well, with, the, within the, AI? Yeah, so the, the question is, um, can you get all the way there based on the rapid uh, increase in progress that's been made by the various uh, techniques, Bayesian, neural net, deep learning, what have you, and what are the limits? And, um, you know, because there, there is this sort of perception that now we're on this fast uptake. We have companies like DeepMind that Google bought for a half billion dollars that can win at video games. Is that about pattern recognition or is that about cognition? If it's on the pattern recognition side, you know, how far can you go with that? Can you build cars that are safe, uh, you know, you know, can drive safely um, by themselves, or you need something more. And I, the, you know, the people in the field that I've talked to argue that you need a, you need a breakthrough on, um, and something that's not just about pattern recognition to get to the next stage. Uh, John, I yep. have a helpful anecdote here, because I was recently on a call with the DeepMind people where they proclaimed how many video games they want. Um, in all, basically every Atari game in the 80s, they could just figure out all the rules, and figuring out the rules is an interesting thing. But at one point, at a, at a break, the guy said, it can win a submarine, but to actually understand what a submarine is, is an object to move through the water that rises and has people in it, that will require a different algorithm. And, as if that was just an incidental problem. And this is obviously an enormous problem. And they just assume that's something they'll lick. But there's no evidence that it does that, because it solved all of the video games by trial and error that no human would ever undertake. And when it learned from one video game, it couldn't take to the next one. It just started from zero each time and brute forced it, yeah. the way it does translation. To, to, to my mind, the more important dichotomy here is autonomy as opposed to intelligence, because we're building these machines that are capable of acting in the world, and we should just not worry about whether it's human intelligence or not. We have enough to deal with the, with the fact that the machines are increasingly autonomous, particularly in the context of being weapon systems. Right, yeah. Have just two more questions. So, yeah. Uh, thanks. The, uh, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. Oops, sorry. I'm going to make it three, but we'll go to yours real quick and then yeah. here's the man to get back. Um, uh, one big science fiction writer that brings a lot of these ideas um, into the public for me is Isaac Asimov. And I was just curious if he had come in through any of the discussions that you'd had. Well, there's the zeroth law. Um, you know, the robots should not do anything to harm humanity. And, uh, I, you know, I have to confess that I did all of my Asimov reading in the sixth grade, and I need to go back to refresh. Uh, it was very influential now, but I feel like, um, you know, all of these things we're discussing were basically first defined by, by Asimov. I'm, I'm not close enough to now to know how they, they're, they're having an impact. Yeah. Um, just a, a question. We're talking mostly about consciousness and cognition. Um, uh, Sherry Turkle and others talk about uh, when people are using technology, there's a reduction in empathy yeah. that, that's noticed. Uh, I wonder about this question of how about emotion versus the question of cognition well, and I'm, the question of empathy in particular. Yeah, I, so I, I, um, I'm very anxious to answer that. I'm loath to do it because I'm working on a story about that right now. And I, my sort of the hint of, of where I'm going is I think it's very culturally prescribed. And so what may be true about our culture may be very different, for example, in China with respect to the things that Turkle was talking about. I mean, she's very worried about people being isolated by their, by their you know, primary interaction with machines. And when I start to probe in different cultures, the, 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 the nature of the way they interact with machines may be very different than the United States. And I'm still sort of poking around there. And so I, I don't want to say anything more than that. Um, yeah. Lewis, hi. Uh, hi, John. Um, thanks for the fascinating talk on, uh, on a cool intellectual adventure. And I was just curious, of all the surprising things that you ran across here, what was to you the most surprising of all of the stuff? Well, I, okay, I, I think um, to me, I mean, this, the simple statement is it's not about the machines. And that's sort of, I, I feel very deeply about the Turing test that way. In, in that um, the surprising thing is how, how profoundly we, in, we respond to the machines, not what the machines do. I mean, we're hardwired to see, to anthropomorphize, anthropomorphize everything that we interact with for whatever reasons. And the, the depth of that and uh, suggested 
in terms of the Turing test that the bar is a lot lower than we think um, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, getting over the Turing test is not going to be a problem at all from a human point of view. That's what the Turing test is about, to my mind, how we perceive machines. And I think that was sort of the thing that really struck me. And um, <clears throat> I want to say, I think that, you know, you, you, I'm so glad the question of diversity came up. You expect this has got to happen here at Berkeley, and I'm proud that we, we, we do this. I do think that diversity actually plays a role here, that there, a lot of the, 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 the goals of AI have a very modernist kind of uh, uh, impetus. And this, I think there's a huge development and benefit to thinking with a much more diverse perspective, that lots and lots of different kinds of thinking are going to be essential to solving these problems in the future. And this is where I think there's an opportunity not only to amplify, but also to integrate interactions between many, many different groups of people with different backgrounds and different, different points of view. So with that, thank you so much, John. <laughs>